Democratic presidential candidate and former Congressman Beto O'Rourke, who joins us now live from South Carolina. Congressman, thanks so much for joining us uh, on Friday, uh, you learned your draw for the Democratic debate later this month. You're going to be debating on the first night. You had a splashy entrance into the race, but since then, it seems as though you've been struggling to gain support. What do you think went wrong, and, and what are you going to do to try to fix it? Look, we've got a, a ways to go to be able to meet everybody, bring folks into this campaign, and make them aware of why this is the election of our lifetime. So if, if I were to rely on polls right now, it would be as though um, that was going to decide the future of not just our race, but the country. And we can't allow that to happen. I've never relied on polls running for Congress, running that race in Texas for the United States Senate. I won't rely on them now. And as president, I won't rely on polls to do what is right. So we're going to continue to show up for everyone everywhere, bring them in and make sure we're up for the greatest challenges of this country's history. President Trump made headlines this week by saying uh, that he would be willing to accept a foreign government's dirt on his Democratic opponent. You said after those comments that the message Congress is sending to the president by not impeaching him is that he can act with complete impunity and that there were, quote, no consequences for his actions. So are you saying that the Democrats are essentially enabling President Trump's willingness to take foreign information by not impeaching him? Yeah, if, if there are no consequences, if there's no accountability, if there is no justice, then we will have set the precedent that it is okay to accept help from a foreign government. It is okay to obstruct the investigation into the interference in our election, and that this and any future president can continue this kind of behavior. So impeachment is incredibly important to get to the facts, to discover the truth, to make sure that there's accountability for the undermining of our democracy, but also to send the signal that this can never happen again, to send the signal to Russia, to send the signal to Donald Trump, to send the signal to this country that we will save this democracy. It's the only way that we're going to be able to meet the challenges that we face. It's the only way that we're going to be able to maintain our system of government. So it is now time for the House of Representatives to act to look beyond the polls and their prospects in the next election and look to the future of this country and the generations that follow who are counting on us to do the right thing today. But you say look beyond the polls, and that's, a, I assume, an acknowledgement that the polls indicate that the majority of the American people do not support impeachment. Does it not matter what the American people support? Is that not an important part of this? It kind of gets to your, to your first question. If, if we rely on polls and what is immediately popular, um, then, then why do we need people in elected positions of public trust? Um, your main responsibility uh, as a member of the House is to do what is best for this country. And, and given the fact that our democracy is under attack, unlike any time in the last 243 years, it's essential that you do your job. Now, that might not be popular, it might not be easy, but it is the only way that we're going to get to the truth. It's the only way that we're going to save and restore this democracy. And it's the only way we're going to prevent these kinds of attacks uh, going forward. I think the president's admission this week that he would take help from a foreign government going forward is all you need to know about the importance of impeachment and that, that impeachment beginning now. The New York Times reported this weekend that the United States government is escalating its cyber campaign against the Russian power grid. The Times reported the two administration officials said they didn't believe President Trump had been briefed in detail on the efforts and that, quote, Pentagon and intelligence officials described broad hesitation to go into detail with Mr. Trump about operations against Russia for concern over his reaction and the possibility that he might countermand it or discuss it with foreign officials. Now, I know you have no faith in President Trump's leadership, but taking a step back, isn't it troubling that there are, are apparently Pentagon and military officials who are taking these serious actions against Russia without briefing the president in full? This is a dangerous set of circumstances, um, but it's completely understandable given this president's behavior. In 2017, he shared classified intelligence that we obtained from an ally and a partner with the Russian government. Um, he's invited the help of foreign powers. He sided with Vladimir Putin on that stage in Helsinki, Finland, instead of our own intelligence community. So it's no wonder that there is a lack of trust between military leaders, our intelligence community, and the president of the United States, the commander in chief. And, and this dynamic imperils the United States. It makes us less safe than we would otherwise be 
as his national security advisor and his cabinet push us in to what perhaps will be another war with Iran. Uh, this president has made a mess of our foreign policy and has significantly diminished the national security of this country. I want to talk about some domestic issues, too. Your fellow Texan and 2020 candidate Julian Castro's immigration plan calls for the repeal of a law that makes it a crime to enter the United States illegally. Do you agree with that? Should that law be repealed? I don't know if it should be repealed, Jake, but I think that we should acknowledge that most of those who are arriving at our border right now, especially from Central America, are at their most desperate and vulnerable moment. They pose no threat or harm to this country. And we've proposed a family case management program so that they are not held in detention uh, at a fraction of the cost and at an improved rate of showing for their court date or their appointments with ICE officials. We help them to follow our own laws and we treat them like the human beings that they really are. So policies of caging kids or separating families or metering where we have migrants and asylum seekers wait in Mexico, uh, where they are prey to, to criminals and uh, mm. to those who, who would take advantage of the most vulnerable. Um, that cannot be this country. We have to live our values and ensure that our laws reflect our reality and our true interests in this country. Okay, but just, just to get a straight answer on it, it sounds to me like you think the law that makes it a crime to be in this country illegally, it sounds like you think that that should stay the law. I think what I'm saying is that in the vast majority of cases, um, there's no need to incarcerate or to detain migrant families and especially children. But if somebody is attempting to smuggle human beings into the United States, if they are attempting to cross illegal drugs into this country, I want to make sure that we have um, the legal mechanism necessary to hold them accountable and to detain them to make sure that they, they do not pose a threat to this country or to our communities. But you disagree but, but with the bigger you picture. You disagree with Julian Castro. You don't think that it should be repealed. Yeah, I've, I've answered the question. I, okay. I do not think that it should be repealed, okay. but I'm trying to get to the, the heart of the issue, which is that Got we it. treat people humanely, that we improve our security, not through walls and through cages, but by making sure that those who are at their most vulnerable, who are trying to follow our asylum laws, are able to do that, and that we then rewrite this country's immigration laws in our own image. Having people come out of the shadows demonstrably makes us safer. Having folks trust local law enforcement because they have no fear that it will lead to their deportation makes our communities stronger, more secure, and safer. And then it allows this country of immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees to truly live our values to the benefit, not just of those immigrant families, but to the entire United States of America. All right, thank you. I appreciate, appreciate that. The, the Democratic frontrunner, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, has been taking some heat for, for changing some of his previous positions from expressing regret over his Iraq war vote to flip-flop on the Hyde Amendment. You said this week that you're not sure what Biden believes. What did you mean by that? Well, I mean, you're giving us some examples here. Um, within the same campaign, he said that he supported the Hyde Amendment, which would prevent uh, middle and lower income women, particularly of color, from being able to make their own decisions about their own body and having access to the health care that would make that possible, changed his position on that. He's dismissed China as not a real threat to the United States of America at a time that they have grossly violated the rules of trade, uh, made it harder for the American worker to be competitive on a national stage threaten our interests and those of our allies in the Pacific and especially in the South China Sea. China is a very real threat and we need a president and a commander in chief who recognizes that. Um, and I also just think it's, it's incredibly important that we meet the, the challenges that we face, whether it's those that we just mentioned or climate change with the urgency that they demand with new ideas, new leadership, and a different way of bringing people in and together to meet these shared challenges. Before uh, I let you go, today's Father's Day. I know you hope to end the day back in El Paso. I want to ask you about your kids. We're showing a picture there. Uh, Ulysses, Molly, Henry. In a documentary on HBO about your, your run for the Senate, your son said about the campaign, quote, I'm ready for it to be over. How have they been handling uh, the presidential campaign so far? You know, it's, it's tough, but we are reminded that there are, are folks, there are families who have it much harder. Um, there are fathers who today are deployed overseas 
putting their lives on the line for this country, badly missing their families. There are dads here at home in the United States whose daughters and sons are, are making that same kind of sacrifice right now. So in our family, we have a conversation about this defining moment of truth for this country and making sure that all of us stand up to it, stand up to be counted, stand up together, and stand up to make sure that my kids and your kids and the generations that follow are proud of the decisions that we made in this year and the year that follows. That's why I'm running, uh, running for, for everybody's kids, everybody's families, running for everybody in this country to make sure that we live up to our potential and to our promise. All right, Congressman, I hope you get back to El Paso before, uh, before bedtime for those kids. Happy Father's Day to you, sir. Happy Father's Day. Thank you.